right, good morning class, good evening, good day, whatever time you are watching this, let's jump into a new chapter. Uh, so chapter 17, we are now returning to. Uh, we previously dipped our toes into chapter 17 when we were talking about the solubility product and the uh, partially solub or the partially soluble nature of mostly insoluble compounds. The reason why we jumped into chapter 17 is that section has always felt like an odd uh, component of chapter 17 when the rest of chapter 17 is all about uh, acid and base equilibria. So what we are going to be talking about now in chapter 17, we are looping back to the beginning of chapter 17 here, we are going to be talking about uh, the common ion effect as it pertains to acid-base equilibria. This lecture is going to be relatively short, um, but it is going to be a good introduction to the deeper material that we are going to be getting into on Friday and continuing on Monday. So our trajectory is actually that we're going to be finishing chapter 18 by the end of this semester. So we have, uh, as of this lecture, I'm going to be giving, um, what, six, I think, lectures left, seven. So we have Wednesday, Friday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, and that's it. That's all we have left. Uh, so yeah, we're going to be winding down here pretty quickly, um, but yeah, let's let's not delay. Let's jump into now this material in chapter 17. So we're going to build a smaller foundation for the rest of the chapter we're going to be talking about where we're going to be getting into neutralization reactions. All right, but before getting into neutralization reactions, it's going to be important to uh, discuss some of the more nuanced behavior of acid-base equilibria. So what we're gonna start today talking about is the pH of salt solutions, being we're not explicitly adding a weak acid or a weak base into solution. Um, and previously, salts we have defined to be some type of ionic compound. So what we're looking at is the pH change potentially uh, in aqueous conditions when we're adding an ionic compound. And previously, uh, back in like chapter nine, we talked about ionic compounds when being dissolved in solution as having a pH that is equal to seven. But what we are going to be talking about now, or at least addressing, is that this isn't always true. And here are the two main reasons why. First, some salts, so some ionic compounds, uh, contain weak or conjugate bases inside of them. The second point is that some salts contain weak or conjugate acids inside of them. So let's break these two examples down. We'll start with the conjugate base. So sodium fluoride is an ionic compound. We know that this is ionic since we have some type of cation, which is a charged metal, and we have an anion, which is a charged non-metal. So it's going to be increasingly important to go back to those old lessons, like what does it mean to be ionic? What does it mean to be molecular? Since uh, the realm of acid-base chemistry kind of uh, blurs these lines a little bit. But if we have some uh, metal and non-metal bound together, we have some ionic compound. And if this ionic compound is soluble, which our sodium compounds we've learned tend to be mostly always soluble, we are going to get some type of dissolution that occurs in uh, aqueous conditions. So the sodium fluoride, when introduced into water, is going to break into sodium plus aqueous and fluoride minus aqueous. Now this so far should not be too surprising, right? If we take some type of ionic compound that is soluble, right? This compound is soluble. We drop it into water. We're gonna get it uh, breaking up into two different ions. Now we're going to inspect these two ions in solution because this is where the potential pH change is going to be coming in. Uh, so we have sodium plus and fluoride with a minus charge. The question that we, are, we have to ask ourselves now when observing salts in solution is, are either of these ions weak or conjugate acids or bases unto themselves? In other words, is there a way for Na plus or F minus to interact with water either to generate some H plus or some OH minus when it interacts with the water? Now, sodium plus has no hydrogen on it, uh, meaning that there is no way for it to generate H plus in solution. Um, so no H plus. 
We also uh, know that sodium, if you were to like put this in water, sodium plus in water, it does not spontaneously generate OH minus in any way. In order for that to happen, this would have to write, if it's going to act as a base, pull H plus onto it, which is impossible. So sodium does not act as an acid or a base by our like conventional definitions of acids and bases, our Bronsted-Lowry definitions that we've been using. F minus, if we turn our attention here, also does not have an H plus on it, but we recognize this as some type of base, right? The F minus, if it were to interact with water, which it is liable to do since this is in aqueous conditions, there's tons of water around, this F minus is able to reversibly interact with the water, pulling a hydrogen away from it and generating some OH minus as a result. So because this F minus, when interacting with water, is able to generate some OH minus, we would expect the pH of sodium fluoride pH to be greater than seven. It is going to be basic or result in basic conditions when added into water. The second example we have, this ammonium chloride, we can set up solid. Uh, an example in the exact same way, this ammonium chloride as a solid when added into water is going to break up into its constituent ions. So we have the polyatomic ion of ammonium with an NH4 and a plus charge here. This will be aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. All right, so we're going to inspect both of these ions in exactly the same way that we just did the sodium fluoride. Uh, so first we have the ammonium ion, and the question here is, can this pull an H plus onto itself? Can it act as a base? Probably not, since it already has a plus charge, it's not gonna want to attract any additional hydrogens to it, so any H plus in solution is not going to be attracted to this NH4 plus. However, this NH4 plus does have a bunch of hydrogens and an extra plus charge, which means that if this were to interact with water, NH4 plus, aqueous, we can imagine a situation where water nearby is going to take one of these extra H pluses away from the ammonium. Uh, this will leave us with an ammonia, which we recognize also as a weak base, and H3O plus. All right, so here we have uh, an ion in solution, this NH4 plus, which is able to generate H plus or H3O plus in solution. Uh, so before we come to a final decision on its pH, let's also observe the second ion that's present here. So the Cl minus. Obviously there's no hydrogen here, so there's no way that this can act as an acid in solution, but is there a way for this to act as a base just like how the F minus did? Well, let's draw out what that would look like. If this Cl minus were to act as a base and pull an H plus onto itself, this would result in HCl. HCl we know is a strong acid, which means that a uh, like any type of HCl that would regenerate in solution would immediately break back down into H plus and Cl minus, right? Strong acids are strong because they dissociate irreversibly. There is no way for this Cl minus to be strong enough of a base to pull H plus onto it because its conjugate acid, Cl minus's conjugate acid, is a strong acid, which means this reverse reaction breaking into ions is going to dominate. Overall, what this means for our NH4Cl when it is added into uh, aqueous conditions is we have some type of weak acid here, this NH4 plus, which is able to generate some H3O plus, and we have this Cl minus, which is too weak of a base to counter the acidic behavior of the NH4 plus. Overall, we can draw the conclusion that the pH of NH4Cl when added into solution is going to be acidic or less than seven. Okay, so what this means overall, why we're paying attention to the pH of salt solutions is that when we add some salts into solution, we are going to get some type of pH change, which is either going to alter just the pH of neutral water or would potentially interact with an acid or a base that is already in solution. All right, so let's explicitly calculate uh, the pH of a salt solution before moving on. 
um, you know, and looking at what it looks like in solution when we have some acid or base already present and how these things are going to interact together, right? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So the pH of a salt solution, uh, we can calculate in the exact same way that we have been calculating pHs and pOHs, or pOHs uh, of weak acids and weak bases. So we have a uh, Sodium fluoride here, we're told what the volume of our water is. We are dissolving 0.5 moles of the sodium fluoride, and here we have a Kb present for our weak base that we've already identified. Our goal is to find the equilibrium pH. So we've already estimated that this is a pH uh, that should be greater than 7, so let's find what the exact pH is going to be. All right, our first step is we have to figure out what is the initial concentration of our F minus in solution, since the F minus itself is what is the base. The sodium fluoride, not basic. Once this dissociates into sodium plus and fluoride minus, that fluoride minus is what is the base. So our first job is to figure out stoichiometrically, mm, here's an old word we haven't heard in a while, stoichiometrically, how much of our F minus do we have? All right, so here's going to be the crux of chapter 17. And here's actually why the book separates chapters 16 and 17. Because yes, what we're talking about is acid-base chemistry, but we are going to be bringing back uh, stoichiometry, tying that back into the calculations that we're gonna be doing. The question that you need to be asking yourselves is, is the reaction complete? If the answer is yes, if your reaction is a complete reaction, like our sodium fluoride dissociating into sodium and fluoride in aqueous conditions, what this means is that we are going to be using stoichiometry to perform our calculations. If your reaction is reversible, then we will be using the ice table approach. So we have to be, or make sure that we are keeping our math, our algebra consistent and straight with whatever type of equation or chemical reaction we are observing. All right, so let's turn back our attention to the sodium fluoride. Well, we know that we started with 0.5 moles of the sodium fluoride, and since this dissociation reaction happens in a one-to-one, -one, there's going to be one mole of fluoride that is generated per every one mole of NaF that gets used up. Writing this out, may suddenly seem very trivial or mundane or unnecessary, but I promise getting back into the habit of explicitly showing your stoichiometry is going to be very useful as we start working into the more and more complex problems. So we're going to break down our problem into two pieces. Our first piece here is the complete dissociation, which is going to generate 0.5 mole of F minus that is going to be present in solution once all of the sodium fluoride has completely dissociated into our F minus. Okay, now that we have our moles of fluoride present here, uh, our next job is to use this value in uh, the calculation for figuring out what the pH of our solution is going to be. All right, so in order to clean this up a little bit, I am going to erase the writing on the screen. So if you have not yet written down everything, please do so. All right, now that this is erased, right, we have figured out how many moles of our F minus we have in solution, our 0.5 moles of F minus. And from here, we are going to now set up our reversible uh, acid base reaction with water. Uh, in much the same way that we just wrote the equation on the previous slide when we were demonstrating that F minus is able to act as a weak base in solution, uh, our F minus, now that it is broken away from all of our sodium pluses, can interact with water reversibly to create um, some HF, no charge, aqueous conditions, and some uh, OH minus aqueous. All right, so the way that we're going to now use this setup is the exact same way that we've used any time or any case of a weak acid base equilibria looking for pH kind of problem. So we have our F minus, we know an initial condition, we have 0.5 moles per every one liter. 
Again, it is going to be incredibly important to uh, convert all of our values in the ice table into the units of molarity, since all of our equilibrium constants, our Ka's, our Kb's, are all types of Kc's, which means we need everything to be in concentration units. All right, that's just a general reminder. Uh, we're gonna be looking for some type of change and then finding an equilibrium value. Water, again, don't have to worry about since it is a liquid. Nothing new is happening there. Uh, we're not changing the rules all of a sudden. This is a heterogeneous equilibrium uh, problem, which means the water we are not going to count. Now, initially, right, since we're only taking sodium fluoride and dissolving it in solution, there should not be any HF present. And similarly, there is no OH that has already been generated from the sodium fluoride. This is exactly what we are here to calculate. What is the change that is occurring as the F minus is interacting with water and creating these new products once equilibrium has been reached? All right, so 0 0.5 minus X with an X here and an X here. Uh, okay, so our problem already is almost complete. The reason being is I am going to take a shortcut in solving for this problem since our KB is equal to an incredibly small number, right? 1.40 times 10 to the negative 11 is very, very small, definitely smaller uh, than our initial conditions by a significant margin. So what this means is I'm going to take the shortcut where I can drop this minus X here since the change from our initial condition is going to be so insignificant. So our KB is going to be equal to X squared, since we have our two products multiplied together, all divided by 0 0.5. Now when rearranging and solving for X, our X is going to be equal to 2.65 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. All right. This X is not what we were charged to find though. Our X we can see is equal to our equilibrium concentration of OH minus. Our OH minus concentration is not what we were explicitly looking for, right? We're looking for equilibrium pH. What this means is we are gonna have to use our KW is equal to concentration H plus times concentration OH minus since we are working in aqueous conditions to be able to solve for what our H plus concentration is. In rearranging this equation, our H plus concentration is equal to KW, all divided or divided by concentration OH minus, which is what our X value is equal to. Our KW is equal to 10 to the negative 14. This is all from chapter 16. Our KW value is not changing. Take this divided by 2.65 times 10 to the negative 6 molar. Uh, and what this means is that you are going to end up with a concentration of H plus that is equal to 3.78 times 10 to the negative 9 molar. Last but not least, we uh, can use this to solve for what our pH is equal to, since pH is equal to negative log of this concentration that we just found. Our pH is equal to 8.42. All right, so I flew through that math. Absolutely, go back, take your time, see if you can't uh, hit these big check marks, uh, you know, as you're going through the calculations. Um, the important part, the important takeaway, is that we predicted that the pH of this sodium fluoride in solution would be greater than seven. And here we can see that we do in fact have a solution that is uh, of basic conditions. Our pH is greater than seven. And this is all because our F minus was able to act as a weak base interacting with water and generating some OH minus in solution. So if you are faced with a similar problem, but it is from the weak acids perspective, you're still going to go through this problem in the exact same way, only instead you will have a Ka instead of a Kb. But you are uh, ultimately first going to set up your dissolution as the ionic compound breaks down into solution, and then you will use either the uh, weak acid or weak base component after the dissolution has occurred to figure out what your pH is. All right, but as I had previously mentioned, we're not just looking at this, you know, for kicks. We're going to be looking at what the influence of the salt in solution is now that we uh, 
you know, have broken this up, what happens if the dissolution of this salt happens when in, a, in the presence of a solution that already has some type of acid inside of it? Well, here's where we are going to turn our attention to a definition that we have already learned, the definition of the common ion effect. Here we have it worded in a slightly different way than what we have learned before, but honestly, I think that in rearranging the wording, it kind of clears up the true meaning of the common ion a little bit better. So if a solution already contains a solute of an ion that is in common with a given reversible reaction, that ion is a common ion. And that is because the ion is in common between a solution that already exists and some type of reversible reaction that you are interested in studying. If these two things have something in common, specifically if that thing is an ion, that ion is a common ion. Now with the common ion effect that we have observed before, we had stated that the presence of a common ion uh, decreases the solubility of your partially soluble compound. Something similar happens when we are studying acids and bases. In this case though, the common ion is known to decrease the dissociation of your weak acid or weak base. For instance, if we're looking at the dissociation of a weak acid here, our weak acid is HF in aqueous conditions, it breaks into H plus and F minus. Well, if this reaction, which is a reversible reaction, were to take place, in a solution that already contains F- minus because sodium fluoride was dissolved beforehand, well, we're, uh, we can think back to Le Chatelier's principle to understand what is happening according to the common ion effect. This reversible reaction already has some F- minus present from the solution that the uh, reaction is now trying to take place in. Because we have increased the concentration of one of our products, according to Le, Ch uh, Le Chatelier's principle, we are going to shift this reaction backwards towards reactant, which is exactly what the definition of our common ion effect here states, that we are decreasing the dissociation of our weak acid or weak base. In this example specifically, it is a weak acid, but the same thing can be said to occur with a weak base. If a product is already present, we are going to shift our equilibrium balance back towards reactant. All right, so let's get a quantitative example of the common ion effect. So let's take a one molar solution of HF. Uh, Ka of HF is known to be 7.1 times 10 to the negative four. And this solution, when it is allowed to reach equilibrium, has a pH of 1.57. So if a weak base, our sodium fluoride, is added to solution, what is the pH after equilibrium is reached? Is it going to be basic, like how we saw the sodium fluoride solution be? Is it going to be acidic, because we have this weak acid present here? Is it going to be close to this 1.7 or 1.57 that is initially told to us? Like, what's going to happen? So in order to solve this problem, there are a couple of different steps that we are going to have to follow. The first step is the exact same step from the previous problem that we learned. Because there is a salt that is present, step number one is that you must dissolve your salt. The salt must actually be dissolved in solution in order to interact with the reversible acid-base reaction. So our salt, as it is going to dissolve in solution, is the exact same equation that we've seen. I'm trying to keep the examples here kind of like self-consistent throughout the lecture, uh, not just today, but the entirety of chapter seven, so we can compare and contrast different situations. Our sodium fluoride is going to break up into our sodium plus and our fluoride with a minus charge. We're using the exact same molar amount. So we started with 0.5 molar sodium fluoride. As it breaks up, we are going to end up with 0.50 moles of fluoride ion. Because we are assuming one liters of solution, and this is just for simplicity's sake, what this means is that our initial fluoride or concentration, as uh, everything you know, is going to be interacting in solution, our initial fluoride concentration is going to be 0 0.50 molar, since we are taking 0.5 moles and dividing it by one liter. This is going to be an incredibly useful number to us. The reason being, we are now going to set up our fluoride dissociation, step two, 
in the same way that we have set up every type of previous acid-base interaction. The acid here is the weak acid. It is going to be the uh, like species of interest to us since we are studying acid bases in solution. So we're going to write out our dissociation reaction like so. Uh, oh, so yeah, step one is dissolve your salt. Step two is going to be write out your dissociation reaction that is of interest to you. So our weak acid is going to interact with water and that is going to generate some F uh, minus aqueous and some H3O plus aqueous. Our ultimate goal is to find a pH. Our pH that is provided to us here, I'm just going to like straight up disclaim, this is a reference pH. We are not going to be using it in our calculation in any way. I wanted to include what the pH of uh, our straight up just HF solution was for a point of reference. So we're not going to be including that in our calculation at all. We have all of the other pieces that we need though to solve this problem according to our ICE methodology. Note, our reaction here is a reversible reaction. Reversible. Which means that we do have to use an ice table to solve for any type of calculation that we want at equilibrium, pH included. So of our information that is provided, we have a 1.0 molar solution of HF initially, water, who cares? Our F minus initially, we can see, again from our calculation that we just did, that we had a, or have a 0 0.50 molar solution initially. And you may be asking yourself, well, can we do this? This seems kind of like cheating, right? This HF, this one molar HF existed before we threw the sodium fluoride in it. So shouldn't we let this HF one molar uh, solution reach equilibrium and then add this 0 0.5 molar solution of F minus disturbing its equilibrium and then finding a pH that way? To that question, I answer, yes, you can do that. But I'm also here to tell you that if you do it the way that I am presenting here, where we are, uh, where we are adding all of our initial uh, conditions together in the same initial step, Algebraically, it works out the same. And in fact, this method that I'm teaching you is easier. Uh, there are less calculations that you have to do. And if you are looking for a way to cut corners because our problems are actually getting longer and longer, this is definitely a shortcut that I would recommend. Writing all of your initial conditions into the I row before continuing with your problem. If you would be more comfortable starting with the HF, this one molar solution, breaking it down into equilibrium and then throwing the F minus in, I'm not gonna stop you. Again, algebraically, you will get the same answer. It's just a longer problem if you do it that way. All right, so initially we have our HF in its one molar uh, solution. We have this F minus that is a 0 0.50 molar solution. Uh, we have this H3O, um, that initially we are not told any information about it. Yes, we do have a reference pH, but remember that these pHs are at, at equilibrium, not initial conditions. So we are going to assume that we have no H3O plus initially, right? None initially. This uh, pH of a 1.57, we can imagine is like a different flask that is sitting off to the side for reference, right? This is a control flask. So we are now going to let this reaction reach equilibrium. We are going to let the HF dissociate into F minus and some H3O plus to actually fill in this gap here. Uh, meaning at equilibrium, we will have one minus X, 0 0.5 plus X and X. Okay. The Ka that we can see here is of a magnitude that is 10 to the negative four, which means it is not small enough to be able to take a shortcut here. So we're gonna have to do our math the long way. So if you have not yet copied down this information here, please do so. I'm gonna clean up the slide a little bit to make room for the algebra that I am about to do. All right, so the algebra that we need, we have our equilibrium constant Ka, this is going to be equal to the concentration of our products from the reversible reaction we just wrote, our F minus, our H3O plus, 
all divided by H F concentration. Uh, let's actually start plugging some numbers into this. So our Ka is 7.1 times 10 to the negative four. The concentrations that we just solved for, the F minus concentration was a 0 0.5 plus X, all multiplied by the X from the H3O uh, plus concentration, all divided by one minus X. Uh, from here, it is going to be a matter then of algebraically rearranging and solving for uh, a quadratic setup so we can actually use the quadratic equation. So our 7.1 times 10 to the negative four, all multiplied by one minus X, right? We're gonna multiply this denominator up equal to 0 0.5 plus X all times X. Uh, let's take this constant, we'll distribute it in. Same with this variable X, distribute that in to our parentheses. This is going to uh, give us a 7.1 times 10 to the negative four minus 7.1 times 10 to the negative four X all equal to 0.5 X plus X squared. And if we rearrange everything, uh, pull all of our terms to one side, so everything is equal to zero, this gives us X squared plus 0.501 X minus 7.1 times 10 to the negative four, all equal to zero. All right, almost done. If we plug uh, the necessary terms here into the quadratic formula, just kind of following my arrow in a wispy way here, what we find is that our X, which according to our ice table is equal to our concentration of H3O plus, that's just as a reminder, uh, is equal to 0 0.00, 0, wow, 0 0.00141 molar. And from here now we can calculate a pH pH being equal to the negative log of 0 0.00141 molar uh, equals a pH of 2.85. All right, so re to readdress the problem that we were working with, we had a solution uh, that was a combination of HF and the control HF solution had a pH that was 1.57. We added some F minus to the solution and the same uh, like amount of sodium fluoride when added to solution we just saw led to a pH that was above seven, a pH that was around eight-ish. So the combination of the uh, weak acid and the weak base, which is the acid's conjugate base, we can uh, draw the conclusion from this problem that we just solved that the weak acid is the dominant component in this solution since the pH here is still going to be acidic. Also notice that the pH did rise, right? The pH rose in this uh, solution because of the common ion effect. Just to go backwards, yes, here. We increased the amount of F minus that was present in solution initially, which means that we shifted our reaction backwards towards HF. According to the common ion effect, this is true. In the process, it also means that we lose some H plus, right? We lose the other product as well when this reaction shifts backwards. Since we're losing our H+, we would have been able to predict ahead of time, uh, had we actually spent the time to think about it, that our pH should have shifted more towards the basic, which is exactly what we saw here. The control solution had a pH of 1.57. We added some weak base, which was the conjugate base of HF, and we saw that its pH went up a little bit, right? It is closer now to the basic side, just a little bit, but enough that we can say that it significantly has shifted. All right, and that's all we're gonna talk about today. I feel like, yes, in terms of general topic, we only introduced the pH of salt solutions and how the common ion effect uh, you know, exists with these weak acid, weak base cases, as well as the insoluble solids. But this is, I guarantee you, more than enough uh, for you to like kind of chew at the bit at until we get to Friday's lecture. I wanna give you guys the practice or the time to practice these types of uh, like salt or common ion effect types of problems. Keep those algebra skills sharp. Uh, so homework corresponding to this lecture will be due on Friday. Um, we are definitely coming to the end of all of these units, um, so be paying attention for uh, either study guides to be posted or as we're approaching finals, ask me those questions. Um, when it comes to scheduling of the final, I am pretty sure 
What we, uh, we being us faculty, are supposed to do is stick to the original registrar's schedule. I'm going to figure out, though, exactly what the nature of taking the final is going to look like, because for those of you who are in Mountain Time or the West Coast, um, the times originally scheduled might not work for you because, for instance, if you're in the 10 a.m. section and you live in California, you would be expected to take our final exam at 5 in the morning. I don't want to have to force anyone to do that. So I'll be posting an announcement sometime in the next week with a concrete plan for the final until I actually post that announcement. Just kind of like hang on to those questions all surrounding the final. I'm figuring that out. Um, update on the ACS exam. Uh, we are obviously not taking it this semester. Whether or not it gets canceled or postponed um, is still yet to be decided. But what this means is that for the calculation of uh, the like exam grade column, I am only going to be looking at the four exams that we are taking in class, and I will be dropping the lowest score of those four exams. So I'm not just going to like say the ACS exam still counts and that that's the exam I'm dropping for ev everyone. I mean, that doesn't really seem fair to me. So. Um, only your three highest exam scores for the semester are going to count. Uh, whichever one ends up being the lowest will be dropped from your score after exam four gets turned into me on Friday. All right, so I think that is it uh, for today, including announcements. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna let you guys enjoy the rest of your week. If you have any questions on exam four, don't hesitate to let me know. Um, but otherwise, class is dismissed. <laughs>